Welcome to another Apollo Papyrus episode. I am Aaron Apollo Camp. For this episode, my interview guest is a sets and relationship researcher who has written the autoethnography, 177 Lovers and Counting, My Life as a Sets Researcher. Her name is Leanna Wolf, and here's my interview with Leanna. Leanna Wolf, welcome to Apollo Papyrus. Thank you. Feel free to introduce yourself to our listeners. All right. Well, I'm a anthropologist and a sexologist, sometimes calling myself a sexual anthropologist. And I have a new book that just got released in January called 177 Lovers and Counting, My Life as a Sex Researcher. And the reason I've been in asking to be invited on podcasts such as yours is to talk more about my research, my process, and to interest folks in getting a look at my book. What is or was your work as a set and relationship researcher like? Oh, well, it began certainly as a, a young person who just wanted to figure out that world however I could. And being a shy teen, largely what I did was read things and watch other people and talk to my friends. And then some of the reading I did turned out to be in anthropology, which may have led me to ultimately decide to become an anthropologist. So what I would do is I'd go to the library and find these monographs by Oscar Lewis, who was doing research in little villages in Mexico. And he'd go into quite a bit of detail about the village women he was observing and studying related to their, how they managed their bodies and their sexuality. And that gave me some clues about um, human possibilities. Later, I did become sexual myself. And... I was always asking questions and trying to figure out more and more. <clears throat> so, for example, when I first had sex with my boyfriend, it was clear to me that nothing much happened in the world of orgasm. And I started doing all kinds of reading and research and questioning to figure out how orgasm works and how women can be orgasmic. Because much of the reading of the day, and this was the 1970s, was um, Cher Heights report on female sexuality, where she was noting that 70% of women did not experience orgasm through intercourse. And then there were um, essays like The Myth of the Vaginal Orgasm. And so I began perusing this, trying to figure it out for myself. And so that's a bit about how I began doing sex research. Ultimately, I became a sexologist, earned a doctorate in sexology, and did a dissertation on polyamory and jealousy which involved a lot of quantitative research that was um, embedded in years of engaging polyamory as a practitioner. Without spoiling uh, too much about your book, 177 Lovers and Counting, what is your book about? Well, my book is about sex research. <laughs> and as I was explaining, it's about the process, the engagement of data and how one makes sense of this data. Because so along the way, I would hear things and see things that proved not to necessarily be the truth. So here I am, let's say, I've heard, one of the things I was able to do was go to West Africa. I went to the very Poor, fascinating country of Niger, where they're known for having a marriage market amongst the 
Wodabe pastoralists. And so I came there to see how it worked. And what I'd heard was extremely different from what I was seeing and how I made sense of it. So, for example, I heard that folks come there, um, assess the goods, and leave with somebody and ultimately marry them because they're pastoralists and they otherwise would have little access to age mates. What, in fact, I saw was a community celebrating adolescent male sexuality. And thus, every evening, the community would gather and the young guys were given makeup, costumes, dance steps, music that was they generated themselves. And ultimately, everyone loved what they looked like, how they moved. And I thought about our culture where young men don't get celebrated for having erotic energy. Instead, they're told to channel it into sports. And they're basically shunned for being um, interested in being sexual. Here, the, co the community was absolutely embracing them for being at this stage of life. How did your book get its title? Okay. Well, I'm, I was teaching anthropology and I taught for somewhere like 37 years. And then around 2018, I faced that the classroom was not working for me as a venue to share my ideas. My students were buried in their cell phones and I had enough money coming in through my future pension that I figured I'd, I'd let this go. So I tried as best as I could to structure, give structure to my life. Because if you've been teaching for in 37 years, you're used to the structure of the academic year, the, the um, syllabi, the midterms, the finals, the grading, the lectures. And suddenly I didn't have any structure. So I thought I'll join a writing group. And I figured I'd join a daytime writing group because that would um, give my day some structure. So I joined this group and it turned out everybody was a bit older than me and had grown up quite differently than I had. You know, I was, I came of age in the peak of the sexual revolution and second wave feminism. I came of age when Roe versus Wade had become the law of the land. I always had abortion backup if I happened to need it. Birth control was widely available and AIDS was not yet a sexually transmitted disease that anyone was aware of or knew about. So the life I lived in my 20s was very different than these folks. They, one of them had been in an arranged marriage. Another one had married her high school sweetheart. And when they started hearing all these stories about what I was writing about and experiencing through travel, adventure, parties, etc., they were constantly rolling their eyes. So I had this sense that they just needed a number. So the next essay I wrote for my group was 177 Lovers and Counting. And I thought that would just give them their answer and we could move on. Instead, the leader claimed I was being provocative and trying to get attention and that I wasn't seriously interested in the critique of the writing group. And she asked me to leave. And I left. And But nonetheless, that title stuck. And when I found um, my publisher, Roman and Littlefield, they loved the title. And there was no question that I wouldn't be using it. Your and as for it being 
accurate. It's, it's pretty accurate. I, you know, at one point I did try to keep track and then, you know, there's all these definitions of, you know, what do you consider having someone having been your lover? Does it mean that you ran sexual energy? Does it mean you engaged in mutual masturbation? Does it mean you did oral sex? Does penetration have to have been part of it for them to have been your lover? Um, all that is something that, um, you know, is up to definition. Your book has been described as an auto ethnography. What is an auto ethnography and how is your book an auto ethnography? And I apologize if I mispronounce that word. No, you pronounced it perfectly, Aaron. Um, an auto ethnography is basically a memoir or, you know, an autobiography um, through the lens of anthropology. And so since I've been living as an anthropologist, uh, through as an anthropologist and ultimately became um, a professional anthropologist earning an MA in anthropology from the New School for Social Research in New York City, I faced that so much of how I was telling my story was reflecting on the interests of anthropology, which have to do with place, with context, with um, the whole praxis of participant observation where one both inserts themselves in a culture and stands back and reflects on that experience both internally and externally. The editor of your book was Elizabeth Sheff. What was it like to work with her on your book? Well, it turns out that Elizabeth and I m first met when she was a doctoral student in sociology and I was um, presenting at a polyamory conference in, at Harbin Hot Springs through an organization called Loving More. And we always had a kinship. And when we and as our careers continued, she would organize panels and invite me to, uh, to present at them. And when I found out that she had a deal with Roman and Littlefield to bring in books related to gender, sexuality, and context, I offered her my book and she was able to accept it. And so it was pretty glorious that this woman who had um, been a very long time friend and colleague was now my editor. So she, but she pushed me. She, it wasn't like, oh, well, you know, we know each other, whatever you do is fine. She really made sure that everything worked made sense we she you know we came up with this idea of contextual sections that we were first calling sidebars but they turned out to not be on the sides of the pages but they were nonetheless um embedded in the manuscript in such a way that one could read more about any of the topics I was mentioning in my personal story. So for example, let's say I'm writing about um, sex tourism. I have a whole section on how anthropologists have studied tourism and have, and the anthropologists who have been involved in sexual tourism in, and then so that there's a, a, and the kinds of questions folks in my field ask, the considerations they make. And then, you know, and that's adjacent to my own story of how I did it. So it's a pretty rich book for people who have a lot of questions and who don't just want to read a, a straight um, memoir, but appreciate the place of history, 
politics, science, and culture in making sense of a life and lived experience. Hmm. As you've mentioned uh, earlier in the interview, Roman and Littlefield is the publisher of your book. Uh, what type of publisher is Roman and Littlefield, and how were you able to get your book accepted by them? Oh, okay. Well, Roman and Littlefield has many different arms, and they've been around for 75 years. They're based in Maryland, though they have a staff that work remotely from many different locations. One of my editors was living in San Francisco. Um, another one was living in upstate New York. Um, the person who was in handled all the d layout and design was based in Colorado. And they do both textbooks as well as trade books. And and professional books. My book, because of the editor at the time who wanted to adopt it, it, had it become a textbook. Though they, at the moment, and the book's been out just since January, so about um, a little over two months, um, they face that it's selling pretty well, and they'd like to re-release it as a trade book so that more folks would... Um, be able to purchase it because as a textbook it's a a little bit pricey because that's what they do with textbooks though honestly if you were to check it out from the library as an ebook it wouldn't cost you anything so um yeah they've been really um organized and efficient and ultimately just a pleasure to work with uh, what led you to study traditional poly polygamy in places like Niger and Papua New Guinea? Okay. Well, um, the first thing that directed me there was the state of my life in the early 90s. I had met a, a partner in 1993 and we were doing pretty well in for the first four years of our relationship. And then in about 97, he got involved with another woman. And I was beside myself. I, you know, I'd had open relationships, but they were the kind that I guess we might call hierarchical polyamory, where the home couple was the primary couple. And all other partners were very, very secondary. Like um, I'd see someone, you know, once a week or less and never stay over their house. And he got involved with a woman who basically wanted to be the primary. And when he said no, he wanted her to be basically a co-primary, we all tried to make that happen and it was honestly very difficult there was the notion of polyamory here in the western world but it wasn't all that well developed so i decided i'd go to africa and see how folks practice traditional polygamy over there and that's what i did i first landed in kenya in nairobi and met with an anthropologist at the university and he explained some of the practices that he had observed in village life. And then I went on to live with a local family in Nairobi. And then they sent me to visit their relatives out in the little village of Rusinga, which was on the coast of Lake Victoria. And there I was really introduced to traditional polyg polygyny, one husband and multiple wives. And I lived with a family and they took care of me. And there were a couple of young folks on leave from university and they did translating for me. And I was able to 
interview quite a few folks. And if somebody hadn't been interviewed, they sent word out that they wanted to be interviewed too. So I'd go over there with my uh, translators and my camera and take a couple of photos and ask them a series of questions. And this ultimately led me to much more information on traditional polygamy or polygyny as it was practiced there. And some of the stuff that goes on in these villages is there's a, a fair amount of jealousy. And the way the wives kind of explain it, as I understood, was kind of like the Miss America story where you're Miss America for the year and then you get replaced by another Miss America and then you become former Miss America. You still have the title, but you don't you're not the most celebrated, um, beautiful woman that year. And so it goes with traditional polygyny. When a man marries a new wife, she becomes his favorite until he marries another one. And then she's still his wife, but she's perhaps no longer his favorite. Now, in Papua New Guinea, it was a bit different because none of the husbands and wives share homes together. They have a traditional men's house and the and the wives each have their own homes where they live maybe with a co-wife but certainly with their children and the boys come to stay with in the men's house when they turn about 6 years old so because no one is keeping a husband overnight there wasn't this jealousy over who is spending more t- he's spending more time with so it worked out very differently there because there wasn't a a way to for anyone to get upset over a husband spending too much time with one wife over another so you know of course i had to ask them well um where do you manage to have sex if you're not spending the night with each other and they explained that they had sex in the late afternoon in their sweet potato gardens. So found a little bit of privacy there, and that's where they um, enjoyed it. Uh, One final question. How has the Me Too movement impacted gender relations and dating in the United States? Okay. Well, basically what's gone on with Me Too is that where Previously, women and men who were um, rape victims were very private about what had happened. And then suddenly, as the Me Too movement exploded in 2017, all kinds of folks owned what that they too had been victimized. They'd been assaulted. And it was no longer a private thing where one was subjected to rape myths like, oh, well, you were wearing very little clothes or you were not escorted or whatever it was, is whatever had happened to you was simply wrong and you no longer felt shame about it. So what's happened is we have a bunch of young women especially who no longer fear the kinds of things I as a young woman went through in the 70s and 80s where I was constantly harassed. I'd walk down a construction by a construction site and I'd get hooted at and yelled at and whistled at and all the rest of it. And now that doesn't happen that way. And what, and basically men have been told that if you're interested in a woman, you better keep it to yourself and don't try to get her to pay attention to you in awkward and disrespectful ways. But what has ultimately happened is we have a lot less seduction going on. Like back when I was a young woman, the first thing you 
always said if someone expressed interest in you was no. And, and then they had to work your no into a maybe. And then if they were persistent and you were actually interested, they'd uh, their maybe would be, become a yes. Now, basically young women are saying, if I'm actually interested, I'll let you know. So what that's ended up with, with a lot of young women being quite alone and being so righteous about not being inappropriately engaged that they're doing very little dating. And young men have are almost clueless in how to get the attentions of young women. And thus, we have more folks engaging in anime, in pornography, in all kinds of private activity, because it's so hard to engage touch with another human being. Leanna, thank you for appearing on Apollo Papyrus. You were an amazing and interesting guest. Oh, you're so welcome. And thanks for inviting me. Leanna was a fascinating and wonderful guest to interview, and I love interviewing interesting people like Leanna. This is Aaron Apollo Camp reminding y'all to write and read your passion. Bye for now. Remember to subscribe to the Apollo Papyrus YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash at Apollo Papyrus and the Apollo Papyrus Substack newsletter at apollopapyrus.substack.com. Y'all can visit the Apollo Papyrus website at camparinapollo.witsite.com forward slash Apollo Papyrus and follow Apollo Papyrus on threads, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr at Apollo Papyrus. Copy Copyright 2024, Aaron Apollo Camp, all rights reserved. This podcast episode is intended for the private listening of our audience. Any reuse or retransmission of this episode without the express written consent of the podcast host is prohibited, except under fair use guidelines. Royalty-free music and sound effects obtained from https colon forward slash forward slash www.zapsplat.com.